So in continuing the tradition of strong Muslim women on the stage, my name is Sadia Sindhu, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Center for Effective Government. We need May soon up here to get you guys to quiet down and pay attention. Thank you. So I, I will say, I feel like we're being a little set up because we followed um, the very funny panel. But, <laughs> but we're here to talk to you a little bit about cancel culture. Uh, my name is Sadia Sindhu. I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Center for Effective Government. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I want to say a special thank you to the MPAC Hollywood Bureau. I'm a proud former board member of MPACs, to the Doris Duke Foundation, and to my fabulous co-panelists here. So we're just going to do a quick round of intros, and then we'll go into our conversation tonight. So Tracy, if you want to kick it off. Sure. Hi, I'm Tracy Bing. Um, I am a producer and former studio exec. Um, now I've, I've been running a, a, an accelerator program called Ride Back Rise for uh, mid-career BIPOC creators who want to tell mainstream stories that um, can hopefully go out broadly and help to affect racial equity. Um, and um, I, that's, that's kind of me <laughs> in a nutshell. Should it be longer than that? No, it's great. Negwa. Hi. Oh, is, this is on. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Negwa Ibrahim. I'm the legal director of the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. Um, I work with a team of attorneys who are working with survivors of human trafficking. Instead of focusing on anything about me, because honestly that doesn't matter, I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, info on the organization. So we are one of the oldest organizations in the country exclusively working with survivors of human trafficking, both sex and labor trafficking survivors. Um, we provide wraparound services. So that means we provide both social services and legal services to survivors survivors of human trafficking. We provide, we run a um, shelter program, so we have two shelters um, that we run through our agency. We also provide uh, permanent housing support, um, rental housing, rental assistance. We also run a uh, 24 hour hotline where we provide um, 24 hours a day hotline services for anyone that needs services, we will answer the phone. But we also run an emergency response program where 24 hours a day we will support survivors of human trafficking that are escaping their trafficking by providing them the support and resources they need to support them in their escape. Almost done. Also, we, we are survivor-centered, survivor-empowered, survivor-led. So that means that in every aspect of our organization, we make sure that we have those with lived experience in leadership positions throughout, and those with lived experience in all of our departments really leading what we do, how we do. Um, and the other thing that's really important about what we do is we also work in partnership with survivors to really change policy to ensure that at a systemic level, we are in making the legislative changes that need to be changed, informed by survivors themselves, because that is not happening otherwise, to ensure that we are putting forth policies that will in fact put an end to human trafficking. Those policies, and I just gotta say this because it really reflects what was talked about in the last panel, those policies are things that address the root causes of human trafficking. The root causes of human trafficking, very passionate, you can tell, so <laughs> you gotta bear with me. The root causes of human trafficking are war, genocide, mass displacement, state-sponsored violence, systemic racism, systemic discrimination, systemic poverty, lack of affordable housing, lack of housing altogether, lack of inclusive immigration policies, xenophobia, all of these things are root causes of human trafficking, and those are the things we need to train, change at a systemic level. And the last thing I'll say is, the other thing we do is events like these. We do trainings, public events across the country to really make sure people understand the truth about human trafficking, because unfortunately the reality is, what is pro propagated within the media, very similar to what, we, what the other panels were talking about in terms of Muslims, what is propagated in the media about human trafficking is just an absolute misrepresentation of the issue. And that has unintended consequences and harm to the issue and to survivors. And so we really work in collaboration with survivors and in collaboration with media to try to ensure there's more accurate representation of the issue of human trafficking and to ensure there are more diverse perspectives being represented on this issue and more diverse survivor 
perspectives being represented on this issue. And we also work with film and television individuals within the industry to ensure they're telling stories that are truly authentic and accurate. Thank you, that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Nekwa. Also, Anissa, before you start, I, if I could just ask everyone to please just stop your conversations for a few minutes. We don't have a lot of time, and the content that we hope to discuss, I think, will be of interest to a lot of folks in this room. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anissa, please. Yeah, it's hard to hear ourselves even think, let alone yes. speak up here. But it's great to see this huge crowd. I'm so glad and so pleased to be with all of you and with all of you here. I'm Anissa Mehdi. Um, like Dean and like Maysoon, I've been around this space for a long time. I remember being one of five people at a pro-Palestinian protest in the late 1960s. It was my mom, my dad, and my two other sisters and me. And, um, and it's not that way anymore. So we've seen the dial move. But that's what inspired me to go into the news media because my dad would be interviewed, Dr. Mehdi, Mohammed Mehdi, one of the leaders in the uh, beginnings of getting public information, public uh, awareness about Palestinians and the suffering of Palestinians and their humanity. Why do you hate the Jews? And he, he said, I haven't been talking about Judaism. I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about Zionism and the Israeli state. This is still something we're dealing with, is, is pulling those things apart. So I went into the news uh, after I got my degree from Columbia in 1982. Uh, and I was the only one like me in the newsroom, an Arab American, a Muslim American, I was Eyewitness News in Boston, CBS News, 60 Minutes, the Evening News with Dan Rather on the Foreign Desk. And it was a chance to bring another perspective to the conversation. Very important to bring not only my voice, but my contacts, my Rolodex. If you don't know what a Rolodex is, it's your database. <laughs> Then I got a really nice job. I got to report the arts for public television for a long time, and then I moved into long form. I'm the first American that got to report the Hajj from location in Mecca, 1998, <laughs> long time ago. My subject was an African-American Muslim whose daughter right now is up for nine Grammys. Oh, wow. Oh, and um, and I worked for Nightline, National Geographic, and other places that uh, allowed me to point big documentary films in a different direction, a more open direction. I got accused of having a bias. She has an agenda. You know, how can we trust what you're saying because you're one of them? But, and this will come out in our conversation about canceling, you have to stick with your integrity and just keep telling the truth. And when the truth is on your side, you may get pushed around, get knocked down, but you get up again. And that's all I'll say right now. Thank you. Brian, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Walker. I am the CEO of an organization called Picture Motion. Uh, we are a social impact company that works with the film, television, and, and media and entertainment industries to drive social change through stories. Um, we develop impact campaigns uh, for feature films, for uh, scripted films, um, for uh, a whole range of projects. Um, right now, we're even working on origin, American fiction, uh, and, and other kind of leading projects in the theaters. And, and so we help them to connect with audiences um, to really have conversations around critical issues, whether they be criminal justice reform, uh, climate change, uh, gender equity, and, and other you know, uh, key issues, and we, we use them to drive policymakers and other decision makers to uh, change their behavior. Um, and so prior to this was at the Walt Disney Company where I work with the chief diversity officer uh, leading multicultural stakeholder engagement efforts. Uh, and then before that was at Color of Change where I started their Hollywood office focused on entertainment and cultural advocacy. And so really bring uh, over 15 years of entertainment and cultural advocacy uh, to this work and, and really uh, got an opportunity to work with Sue uh, uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, six or seven years ago, and, um, and she, everyone knows, she, it was, she calls, you know, you listen. <laughs> and so I'm um, really excited to be here, speak with you, and, and hopefully 
can, hopefully we can uh, share some insights on cancel culture and obviously the work that we lead. Thank, Thank you, you, Brian. And I'm actually I'm getting a do-over because yeah. everybody was talking and I didn't know we were supposed to say so much. So um, my name's Tracy Bing and the reason I got into working in the film industry, um, by the way, I've been coming to Sundance since 1998. I can't believe it. Um, and the reason I got into working in film is that um, my college advisor had said, you love Haiti. Jonathan Demme is doing a documentary on Haiti. This is after I worked in banking for three years. And he said, go work on this documentary. So I did for free. And what was the most amazing thing is we took that documentary, which was about people's stories of torture who had left Haiti to come to America, um, to help affect change surrounding the illegal detention of Haitian refugees in Guantanamo. And so with that experience, I really saw that you can affect change through film and through our stories. And that's sort of been the journey that I've been on um, from the beginning of my career um, through when I was at Paramount Classics um, and then Warner Independent Pictures where I know we'll talk about one of the films I did which was um, uh, Good Night and Good Luck but also March of the Penguins which is actually really a film about global warming um, and uh, to you know working on films like uh, Napoli Ever After which is about black women and hair uh, to South Side With You which is about Barack and Michelle Obama's first date and it was really just a celebration of black love um, and so you know for me this issue of of cancel culture censorship is also about controlling our narratives too so Thank you, Tracy. And thank you all so much for, you know, being here tonight. So I'd mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm with the University of Chicago. I'm probably one of the senior most Muslim women working at the institution and working on democracy reform. It's something that is very close to my heart. It's something I got to do when I was on the board of the Muslim Public Affairs Council and something I continue to do to this day. So before we get started, because I am from a university, I will say that I have been thinking about cancel culture quite a bit, and I suspect a lot of you have as well. We've seen what happened at Harvard, we've seen what happened, what's happening at Columbia and elsewhere. I wanted to just say a few words about cancel culture, because a lot of us, even as panelists, as we were thinking about it, we were recognizing that perhaps there isn't a shared language around this. So if you'll indulge me for just two minutes, I want to share a little bit about what we had been thinking about around this topic. People, I'm going to put on my mommy voice. You've really got to stop talking back there. You. Thank you. Or I'll bring my eight-year-old up here and she'll get everyone to be quiet. <laughs> okay, so the idea of cancel culture. It's something that has been a weapon wielded on both sides of the aisle, especially during this increasingly polarized time in our country. But what is cancel culture? And what are its implications for free speech, for our democracy? How do we seek to hold each other to a higher standard for respect for human dignity in our dialogue while also encouraging freedom of expression and discussion across difference? I suspect several of you were out on the march earlier today and I'm, I'm really excited to get into some of that later. If you look up cancel culture in the dictionary, it'll probably say something along expressing disapproval and exerting social pressure. In a 2021 Pew Research study asking the American public how they define cancel culture, 49% said that cancel culture was about holding people accountable for their words and their actions. 14% said that cancel culture was a form of censorship. Whether it's viewed as a form of exerting social pressure, a measure of accountability, or an attempt to censor public debate, the result of cancel culture is an increasing fragmentation and polarization in our public discourse. People who don't agree simply cannot speak to each other, much less approach a conversation from a place of respect about topics that are close to our heart. And it also puts real limits on our ability to publicly discuss our thoughts and ideas out of worry that whatever our viewpoint is, if we're not in the company of people with the same ideological disposition, we're unable to express it out of fear of what cancel culture might mean for us in our workplace, on campus, on social media, and frankly, even in our relationships. For some of us, the stakes feel even higher. The power dynamics of our society mean that people of color often take the brunt of criticism, regardless of what side of cancel culture they're on. The public sphere finds people of color either easily discarded and isolated or labeled as extremists, meaning that this mode of discourse and engagement can mostly harsh, harshly silence communities that are already marginalized. 
The implications of cancel culture and the silences it creates are stark. We see it in Hollywood, we're seeing it in the press, we're seeing it on campuses, and we're seeing it in our professional settings. The flow of ideas and discussion is stunted. We as a collective can't advance our understanding of problems because we cannot even talk about them. And I would say this is no way of discussing, or so rather running a democracy. Then of course there's nuance to the question, which is what we're gonna get into this, during this panel. How do we show up and voice our convictions? How do we create space for free speech while also acknowledging that ideas that seek to impart unilateral hate on a group of people isn't really free speech at all, but rather an attempt to limit someone else's power and voice? How do we open discussion in a way that centers the free flow of expression while also creating mutual respect for human dignity? How do we take the notion of accountability that so many center in the definition of cancel culture, as well as the openness that's central to free speech and democracy, and translate both into something constructive? How do we start these conversations and go about the careful work of bridging divides, of creating respectful dialogues that allow us to be human with each other and communicate our experience? So that is our task tonight. I have been very good company with this fabulous panel. And I wanted to just start off with a lament that I've been having about cancel culture, which is something that I would argue has led to an intolerance of dissent and a rise in self-expression, sorry, self-censorship. And I'm, it's not just something that I've noticed, um, again, because I am from the University of Chicago, I've got some data to back me up here. Uh, we recently, at the center that I run at the university, we have a podcast and we interviewed a Harvard PhD candidate, Yi Hong Huan, um, about her new paper on self-censorship. She shared that according to a 2021 poll, 80% of college students report that they self-censor. I'm sure college campuses are not the only place where this is happening. And take, for example, what's happening in Gaza right now. I think I happen to operate in somewhat of a unique campus culture where dissent is encouraged um, and self-censorship is not, although one can argue whether or not that is applied to everyone on our campus. But I will say when I speak to friends, when I'm speaking to our co-panelists here as well, folks in media, and, and finance, government, social impact, philanthropy, you name it, any, any space right now, there's such a fear of blowback or being canceled that many are opting to just remain silent or share their viewpoints in, companies that, in, in the company of people who only agree with them. So I'm hoping that if each of you could just help us break this down a bit, is self-censorship showing up in your work or in your communities? And if so, what are the stakes involved in the work that you care about that relates to that self-censorship? So, Brian, maybe we can start off with you and then work our way back. Okay. Um, no, thank you. I, you know, I, I was thinking about this topic. Uh, I have kind of contra contradictory um, ideas about the idea of cancel culture. You know, part of me feels, you know, in many ways, cancel culture, the idea of it is is a dog whistle for um, you know dominant cultures to uh, to try and decrease the level of power that underrepresented communities are have been building. Um, but I also, you know, I being transparent, I recognize that there are times, particularly as a black leader um, in predominantly white spaces in in an industry that has been well known with uh, influence from uh, even Jewish. Um, uh, uh, entities that I've had to self-censor myself even over the last two months and how I respond to the current uh, conditions of, of Gaza and the, you know, the uh, conflict. Um, I've, you know, we've had specifically filmmakers who have shared really um, tough viewpoints that were not aligned with how we feel um, as an organization, but I still run an organization at the same time, uh, practically. I helped to feed and to support uh, employees and their families, and so I have to be very sensitive in how I approach certain topics, and, and so I'm ashamed to even say that I've had to, um, as a longtime activist and a longtime you know, uh, racial justice leader, that have had to you know, really navigate these, these issues um, in ways that I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Um, but yeah, and, and I think that's that's universal for other folks, um, as well as, like I said, I'm a black leader. I'm first in that sense, and um, it, yeah, it's just not an easy question to answer, but I, I think I've seen it uh, uh, as both a pro and a con, or I've seen it as like, 
I don't see it as a big thing, but also I know I've been impacted by the idea of cancel culture um, and what that means. So. And I, I would say for the question, we can also broaden it beyond, beyond Gaza. Like I was thinking of that as an example of something that people feel very passionate about, but there's a lot of self-censorship going on. But I'm curious, self-censorship shows up in a lot of different ways. So if you want to talk about specifically what's happening in Palestine and Israel, but if it, beyond that as well, I, I invite the panelists to jump in. I could take an earlier example because this isn't the first time there's been an issue in the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, I... I it sometimes hurts. It's uncomfortable, and Dean said, you know, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It seems to me on campuses now, it's not okay to be uncomfortable. Um, it's okay to be uncomfortable. And so I'm remembering in 1982, there was a massacre in Beirut of refugees in the Sabra and Shatila camps. I had my first job at, at Eyewitness News in Boston, and uh, my producer pulled me in, into his office and said, Anissa, I know you're a pro-Arab advocate, I know how you've you know, come through the, through the ranks as a young person and stuff. I don't want to make you uncomfortable by assigning you any of these stories to write. I don't want you to challenge your own or, or dishonor your own integrity. Look, I'm a rookie, I followed the rules. He said he didn't want me to write this stuff, he wasn't going to assign it to me, at least he told me it wasn't a secret. So I went and I wrote, you know, about the bo school board elections and the local murders in Boston. There's always something going on. And I went, but I looked at the newsroom, too. I was following the rules, but I looked out there and I went back to him a week later. And I said, Randy, I really appreciate you looking out for me. But why do you, and you recognize I have biases, I recognize I have biases, that's not a question, but why do you think my Jewish colleagues in the newsroom don't have biases? They may be different biases than mine, and they could be the establishment bias, but they have biases too. And I said it really gently. I didn't go in there on the attack. I was curious. I was in, wanted to engage this high-placed executive at Eyewitness News in Boston, the third biggest market in our country. The light bulb went off in his head. I could see it just like a cartoon, like Maysoon's, you know, Marvel cartoons. And he said, you know, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. And you, you've actually studied this situation. You know who the different parties are in Lebanon. You've been around it. I should probably actually have you writing all of those stories. I said, up to you, up to you. But I just wanted to you know, put this into the space. So the situation changed. He did have me writing stories. They're 30 seconds long. How much can you do with 30 seconds, really? But I was watching my words carefully. My point is, I censored myself according to the rules, but I did go back and ask with grace, with calmness, and with the integrity of a real serious news person, what are we going to do about this situation? Because we all bring our baggage with us. And that's still true today. That's still true today, but I have learned in my years that to be vociferous and loud, and you know, that's not what people are going to hear. They're not going to respond to me if that's the way I do it. And if I, if I was unpleasant asking our company here to be quiet, I apologize for that. But I really think it's important to hear what my colleagues have to say. So I apologize for that. No, thank you. And I was just going to add one thing. Anissa, the, the example that you gave us is from several years ago. But what, 1982 like, is more 1980, than several years ago. <laughs> That's a while back. Um, but I will say, if we remember back to the 2016 elections and the coverage around that, the number of people of color, journalists of color, who were silenced in their newsrooms, like it, it, was, it was astonishing. So it, it's, it's an, unfortunately something that is still happening. Progress is not permanent. Yeah. A, wi a wise man said, said that a little earlier today. Said that. <laughs> Sorry, you next got, up, You please. got the label of a wise man, hey. Yeah. hey. Um, so uh, you could probably tell I don't self-censor. <laughs> but I, I will say, uh, so you know, I think when it comes to the issue of cancel culture, um, irrespective of your perspective on cancel culture, I think what's important especially when we're talking about social justice and human rights, that we don't cancel dialogue. Dialogue is incredibly important to actually get to the effective solutions that will in fact ensure that human rights is 
is existing and everyone is living it and experiencing it. And, and human trafficking is one of the greatest human rights issues of our times. And what people don't realize is that it is incredibly prevalent here in the US. People think it's something happening outside of the US. It's incredibly prevalent here in the US and around the world. And I will say that what we experience within the realm of human trafficking, what I've experienced and my colleagues experienced in terms of self-censorship is more around having to, and I feel like MPAC can relate, having to overly strategize on when we want to speak the truth about a particular issue for, our, for, our, for us, it's human trafficking. We have to overly strategize when we want to speak the truth about human trafficking when it's contrary to the dominant narrative. And I think what, what people, and people are like, oh, so what's the dominant narrative? People don't even know what the dominant narrative is or that there is, an e there is even a dominant narrative when it comes to human trafficking because it's been so normalized and dominant. <laughs> and so just to give some insight into what that dominant narrative is, you know, again, what is, and, and, and this is why, you know, I think it's important that we're here at Sundance talking about it because to your point, film and television and media have a remarkable impact to either support social change and social justice or to prevent it. And so when it comes to, when we're looking at the dominant narrative with respect to human trafficking, oftentimes people think of human trafficking as only sex trafficking because that's what you see within the media, that's what you see within film and television oftentimes and more mainstream, but it's not. It's both sex and labor trafficking and both are just as prevalent here in the US and around the world. The dominant narrative presents human trafficking as something only happening to women and girls. That's not true. It's happening to all genders. It's a pan-racial, pan-gender, pan-identities issue. Now that said, those who are disproportionately impacted by human trafficking that does not get represented within media and film and television are those that are disproportionately impacted by systemic discrimination, by systemic racism. And so the other thing that's often the dominant narrative, and this is where we get into having to overly strategize for our organization, is oftentimes when you see movies about human trafficking or stories about human trafficking, guess who's always centered? Law enforcement. Guess who's always the hero? Law enforcement. Guess who's centered as the primary system of intervention that is supposed to end human trafficking? The criminal legal system. And in fact, that can't be furthest from the truth. Because in fact, what we found through doing this work for over 25 years, working in partnership with survivors, being led by those with lived experiences, actually the criminal legal system because of various issues within it, including systemic discrimination and racism, is actually harming survivors, is actually perpetuating trafficking. And it's, it's not the system of intervention. And in fact, the systems of intervention are public health systems, are human rights systems. And we need, to, we need to move away from the criminal legal system. And so what does that mean? People don't realize also never gets represented in the dominant narrative. Most often survivors are forced to commit crimes by their trafficker. People don't realize that. And those who, victims who get criminalized despite being the vic victims, mostly are survivors of color. And that's where what we find when the criminal legal system is used as a primary system of intervention, what's happening is victims are actually getting further victimized. And they're getting harmed. And what's also happening is all, fun, all resources and money is going to law enforcement. And when you talk to survivors, what they say is justice for us isn't incarcerating the trafficker because that actually doesn't end it. Justice for us is healing and what is healing? Access to resources, access to services, access to live in dignity, and to live what they have a right to live with, which is their basic human rights to shelter, to food, to clothing, to income security. That's healing. And then prevention. And prevention is addressing the root causes of human trafficking, addressing everything that I laid out as to, in terms of the root causes and addressing that at, that at a systemic level and at a legislative letter, level. And so when we as an organization, we come out strongly against criminalization. And we take a decriminalization stance 
People are shocked to hear that. We take a decriminalization stance, and we actually believe that we need to move away from using the criminal legal system as the primary system of intervention and look at other public health systems and systems that are rooted in human rights and truly rooted in equity. But here's the thing, when we do that, we, I kid you not, the level of strategizing that we have to do to come out publicly to speak what we know to be true. We know this to be true. This is what will end human trafficking when we address it through a human rights lens. But we have to do so much strategizing with every little message that we have to put out, every little action we have to put out, we have to do in relation to that. Why? Because we'll lose funding, we'll lose partners, and we're a government. We we get we get funding from state and federal governments from private foundations. We'll lose money from private foundations. And I'll just say this: that that funding isn't about my job. We serve thousands of survivors a year in all the ways that I described at the beginning. And there are not many agencies that are out there doing that, and we need more. And so losing that affects survivors and affects this issue of human trafficking and prevents us from ending human trafficking. Thank you, Negwa. Thank you. <laughs> I know how to follow that, but. Um, I don't remember. So censorship in Hollywood, it's been fundamental to the whole Hollywood system. And for me, censorship, as I was bringing up before, is about the control of narratives. So Hollywood has been controlling my uh, African Americans, people of colors, narratives for very many years. And so that is the uh, through through the green light plot process, through you know ad dollars through all of these things, and that's sort of been a way that censorship has happened with, because people aren't able to tell their stories. Now we're sort of in an era where people are starting to be able to do that, and as we all know, it's sort of starting to go in the opposite direction right now, which is really alarming. The pendulum is swinging back this way. Be, you know, Post George Floyd, there was a lot of commitments made to telling diverse stories, and now all of that has sort of subsided uh, with the strikes and the pressure on budgets and all of that. And so I really worry for the future. Um, as we also see in Hollywood, also sometimes filmmakers self-censor their stories. You know, maybe they don't want to tell, see, show their community in a certain light, but or other people feel like I want to show the exact truth to what this, what our, what this experience or this story is about, and others think I don't want to put my people out there in a negative light if I'm going to tell a story because other people are going to latch onto that. So I feel like there's a lot of self censoring that goes on in the media and entertainment, in Hollywood. Um, not to mention we self we self censor ourselves because of. We want to keep our jobs. We've seen several situations recently where people have spoken out and, and, and sort of the internet obviously is a real problem in all this and sort of galvanizing and sort of, uh, of churning these stories and people are fearful of losing, losing their jobs, their livelihood for saying their truth. And, and it really does. I'm going to just jump into the example we were going to talk about, which it is very similar to, you know, McCarthyism and that sort of time where people were really, were, were being you know, witch hunts for, for communists. And they're, they're, some, my, my friend's mother died at 100 years old. She had been blacklisted during that time. She never worked again. And so it's a very similar time. But then in, in, if we're talking about good night and good luck, Edward R. Murrow was able to take McCarthy's words, put it on his TV show, and show the nation. Because at that point in time, we had like two news stations. I might, I might not be getting the number right, but it might have been CBS, NBC, and I think that particular piece was shown on both NBC and CBS. So 60 million people across the country saw it and were just mortified by what was going on. And we had this whole, there was like an arbiter of truth because there was this one sort of, everyone was watching the same thing. Today, we all have our own news channels, we've got our own papers, you can always find someone who has a view that's the same as yours, um, and, and it's really hard for us to know truth and what is right, and that is what's really scary right now. There's no one, we don't have an arbiter of truth and, and, and justice and what's right. 
And one of the things that Maysoon actually mentioned earlier as she was encouraging many of the um, aspiring filmmakers and comedians and storytellers in this room is that there's so many options out there for so many platforms for you to use to get your story out. But there's this other side of that piece as well, which could be really dark. And I'm curious, Brian, I actually, we were chatting a little earlier about your work with Color, um, Color for Change. Did, am I saying that? Yes, perfect. <laughs> um, can, can you share a little bit about that narrative change with all of this, like the proliferation of media and different outlets that have come up and what, what, that, had, what that means for both sharing stories, but also I, I, can, I, I suspect also harming the narratives that one is trying to put out that are more nuanced and well-rounded, et cetera. You know, I, I guess, um when it came to Color of Change, our work was really about building infrastructure and power from both the outside, but also the inside, because I think that's important when we're trying to create narrative change, is that there's always, um, there's always should be an outside force, the public, uh, their response and their critique of the media and the stories that you know, mainstream content creatives make. Um, but then there's also a necessity to have actors internally that are empowered and that are enabled to um, obviously create new practices and to create new narratives that um, can obviously go through those mainstream channels. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think through, you know, I guess from a cancel culture perspective, um, you know, when you're thinking about creating more underrepresented stories, you know, you don't want to tokenize. You don't want to like create one set of stories that are representative of a particular community, you know, because every community is multidimensional, uh, is very nuanced. And so I think as we think about cancel culture as a whole, you know, how do we enable even people within underrepresented communities to tell stories that aren't necessarily positive or aren't necessarily what even their own, you know, their own uh, community wants to see in a sense. Um, so it was a lot of, uh, particularly one of the greatest challenges actually when I was at Color of Change was working with black creatives um, to actually inform them about the harm that might be created by the stories that they might tell. Now obviously our goal was to ensure that they were empowered um, still and, and that they could tell uh, 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 their own personal experiences, but you know, to understand the systemic harm that might come Isn't from that. that. But that feels like a form of censorship then. You know, it, it, and that, I guess people will always say that when it comes to advocacy and, and you know, our goal was about education. Um, we did a lot to showcase statistically, you know, what it meant to have certain tokenized characters or certain, certain narratives about, you know, our communities or the systems and way we interact with those communities. I think a great example is Blackish. We actually consulted on the um, kind of Black Lives Matter episode when it came to Blackish. You know, we, we wanted to talk about obviously the multi generational uh, nuance to how um, black families see policing, how they see, you know, mass incarceration as a whole. Uh, Yara Shahidi's character had a specific, you know, interest. I think uh, the uh, the older son he was interested in going out to protest. And then you had uh, Anthony Anderson saying, you know, when I hear if if something happens around our house or I feel threatened, I'm going to call the police. And so being able to create that nuance is important, you know, and and not just one story or one. Um, like the whole family didn't just agree on one thing. Um, that was the goal is like, how do we showcase, you know, the various ways in which people in our community see these things, but that we can't showcase one as a dominant narrative and, and that it's, you know, it is varied. You know, it's interesting, I, I, I hear you, the question is, and I got this from a conversation earlier today outside, how, who gets to tell the stories, the full three-dimensional stories, warts and all? And is it, are they more authentic when they're told by an Iraqi American about Iraqi Americans? Right. Or is it okay for somebody outside? Or, is, or same with the black American community? And I think we have to be able to, we have to be willing to tell the warts stories because otherwise, you know, it's Pollyanna. Yeah. And nobody's gonna believe us. I agree. So we have to be able to do that. And one of the ways I think to get it done is to make sure that our community knows how to access the news media 
and access the producers and bring stories forward that they might not know otherwise. That could be a whole major program here at Sundance and elsewhere. But um, MPAC certainly knows how to do that. Yes. MPAC certainly knows how to do that. And the, the other big but, but shift... But oftentimes, though, when you're trying to tell the stories, warts and all, sometimes the gatekeepers don't want those stories, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we have to acknowledge that, like, we're not in control, necessarily, of what gets made. Well, that's true. Right? And, and there's going to be notes, you know? People are going to give you notes on your project. So... You know. Well, and then is the question, is it okay to at least get something done, even if it isn't all of it done? Well, I just, I just have to say, and that's where May Soon, I'm going to put you, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot. But exactly what May Soon said on your panel towards the end is that that's where we have to create our own spaces. I agree. We have to, we have to eliminate the gatekeepers by creating our own spaces well, to tell multidimensional stories. And I think... And I will say, I think the problem, you know, even when, when we talk about human trafficking, like oftentimes, you know, survivors are not a homogenous group. Yeah. Very, there's a lot of intersectional identities. There's a lot of different experiences, different perspectives. Here's the thing I would yeah. say is it's much easier said than done to create yeah. a distribution network, which yeah. is what really needs to happen. Yeah. It's not really easy to just like do that, right? Yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. Well, trust me, I've been, I, I would love to do this because yeah. I'd love to create a network, a distribution network to tell BIPOC stories. Yeah. And I mean, A24 has created this, you know, a version of this, but it's telling not necessarily only BIPOC stories, but it's just easier said than done. We can, we can write these stories, you know, there isn't yet, doesn't yet exist yeah. somewhere where we can, we know those stories can go out. Yeah. Now, Tracy, you've been coming here since, when did you say? 1998. Okay, so this is 24. So when you're here in 32, yeah. <laughs> yeah. maybe there will maybe be will. that distribution. So. Maybe network. I will be able to do it. You know, maybe well, I'll be able to. Uh, also, it. we just there got a signal progress. from Sue. Yeah. Huh? Um, maybe, there is progress. It there, may not be permanent. There, there is progress, but obviously we've all seen what's been happening in the past few years. With There's less distributors. There's less movies being bought here, and that includes less people of color having their yeah. movies get out there. And, and that'll maybe continue to happen this year where, where the budgets are pressure, pressured and the people who are making decisions are gonna keep doing the things that make them feel comfortable. Right, and we gotta keep pushing back. And right. we, we've got about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna try to get two more questions in. So panelists, help me with this. Um, I want us to end on something that's very constructive, which is frankly, how do we get to that vision? You know, is it, is it simply how do we, how do we how do we bridge our differences? And is it that we stop self-censoring and encourage others to follow suit? Or is it you know, that we build our own systems? I would say that the current political discourse, and you know, Dean can probably speak to this as well, and we saw Mehdi Hassan, who was recently taken off, um, off air, the current pol political discourse, when it doesn't include nuance, is incredibly impoverished. And there are less sustained efforts to hear and understand and engage. So, I, I would just jump in and say yeah. quickly that what I would love to see, do you remember when, when I was young, people could say things and make mistakes and it was okay. You weren't worried that like the mistake you made when you're nine or 10 was going to be out there when you're 50. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because it's on the internet. So, I mean, I feel like people need to be able to have open discourse with each other, which we are not really doing right now because we're sharing with people who feel the same way as we do for fear we're self-censoring, self as you're saying. So, like, the idea that we could just let go of some of that and be able to ask questions and say things that might be stupid or wrong, but if we can't learn from those and then we're just going to get canceled, that doesn't really achieve anything. Well, it takes courage. It does. And courage doesn't mean you're not afraid. I think courage means you are afraid and you right. do it anyway right. because you know it's the right thing to do. And you know that if you don't say it, nobody's going to say it. And it needs to be done and it needs to be said and it's your privilege, your responsibility, and, and sometimes it, and it hurts. And sometimes people aren't gonna like to hear what you have to say, but you have to say it because it's who you are. It goes back to that self-expression piece that came out from the com comedians. And I, I, I would just like to take us back to the beginning of the conversation. You know, Brian, you were very kind in sharing a little bit of your own experience of, having, of what's happening in Israel and Palestine and how that's impacted you and even just thinking about what you can and can't say. And I feel like there's a place in our discussion to hold grace for each other. And I'd actually, you know, if we, I know we just have a few minutes left. And in a world where it's very easy to cancel people, 
I'm curious how you all would think about, you know, extending grace as people are learning about things, as they're testing things out, as they're saying the wrong things as well. Um, so why don't, why don't we go ahead and start with you, Negwa? Oh, so I, I, I want to um, uh, definitely um, agree with what you're saying, that it's not easy. And I think that, uh, and in no way, I don't think any of us think, no, we all know it's not easy. And I think it's, I think for me, you know, part of, Part of holding grace, um, both for myself and others, I think first and foremost, it's about never, people make a lot of assumptions about others based on what their perspectives might be. And I think that, you know, one of the things I've learned, especially in the area of human trafficking is, I, I, you know, there are people that might not see things the way I see it, but it's not, uh, it's not because they necessarily have malicious intent because they don't know, they really don't understand. And I'll just give you two quick examples. One is we were, um, there was a policy that was getting passed that was going to increase criminalization of human trafficking. Everybody would think that we as an, as an anti-trafficking organization would support that. Yes, more punishment for traffickers. Actually, we did not. And the legislatures that put that forward, they did so because they thought they were doing a good thing. They just didn't know. And I felt like their intentions were good, but they didn't understand because they weren't talking with people with lived experience and they weren't talking with people who've been on the ground doing this work like agencies like ours. And so, you know, um, and what we explained to them when, you know, we had the dialogue and we didn't cancel dialogue and write them off or they didn't write us off is that we explained to them, look, a lot of survivors, a lot of victims of human trafficking are actually forced to traffic others. <laughs> People don't realize that. They're forced to traffic others. And when you increase criminalization of trafficking, those who are gonna be most impacted are actually survivors themselves, victims themselves, and it's gonna be specifically victims of color because they're often not believed to be victims and they're more often than not criminalized rather than treated as victims because of issues around systemic discrimination and racism. So, but, and when the legislatures heard that, they were like, oh, we did not know. And they, they were going to change their position, whether it's in support of or, you know, they're going to change their, their position in terms of supporting that legislation. Second thing was within film and television. A lot of people are making films about human trafficking without talking with survivors and diverse perspective of survivors without talking to agencies like ours. And I don't think it's malicious. I just don't think they know that they should <laughs> or that we even exist, you know? And so we recently got pulled in to speak with um, a, an Amazon series of, um, that's being put out in 2025. The whole season's about human trafficking. They brought us into the writer's room. And again, with dialogue, they, they had no idea, they did not know what they didn't know. And so that's where I think that part of grace is not assuming, not writing each other off, really allowing for dialogue to occur. And then the last thing I'll say about grace is allowing yourself to believe that a different world is possible. And that's where like, I feel you on what you're saying because it is so hard to believe that a world without war, a world without genocide, a world without racism and discrimination and without poverty, without everything that we are seeing in this world, that, a, that it is so hard to imagine that a different world is possible, that we can't have a world without all of that. But we cannot, what's, what's about grace for ourselves and each other is we cannot stop believing that the world that we all wanna see is possible. And so what that means, I'll just end on this, is that that means that because we're all storytellers, Irrespect, we're all storytellers in different ways. That means it's about using our creativity, not just to imagine a different world, but to literally actually create it with your imagination, with your creativity. <laughs> Thank you. That's very sweet. As we're doing right now in this room through this conversation. I just want to add to that. You're absolutely right. Um, we have to believe in that, in that somewhere over the rainbow because we've all been to Oz and we, we, we've all experienced what it could be from time to time. It's fleeting, but we've experienced it. One of the ways I have found to get over the hurdle of disagreement and how do I make that connection that's necessary to not try to hate hate, you know, to end hate with hate and you're wrong because you're wrong to someone else is not an invitation to go forward together. 
and we have to go forward together if we're going to have the world that you've just described. So what I find myself practicing, and it isn't easy, is what I call generous listening. And I'm sure some of you have heard of this term, generous listening. And what I do for myself is when I'm listening to somebody, I have to remind myself, don't be thinking about your counter argument now. I know that's wrong, that's wrong. Don't be thinking about that now. I have to listen as if I know that what that person's saying, no matter how much I think it is BS, it's real for them. It means as much to them as what I have to say means to me. And if I can't respect that in them, their humanity, their passion, their truth, they're going to listen to me. So generous listening, and it's, it is really, it's, it's almost a meditative state. Shut up, self. You know the voice in the back of your head that right now says, what voice in the back of my head? Is listen to them like what they're telling you is their truth, and, you, and I respect it, and I'm willing to take it in. And then it's no guarantee they'll listen to me back, but it's a, certainly a better chance they'll listen back than if I had just been sitting there waiting to tell them how wrong they were. Nisa, I feel like this is very good relationship advice, too. <laughs> Brian? You know, I, I would just say it's, um, it's easier to catch flies with honey than it is vinegar. And, and approaching very similarly relationships with generous listening, yeah, you're not going to agree on majority of topics, uh, particularly with people who have very different backgrounds. And so, you know, really approaching everyone with grace at, at all times, I think, is really critical in that sense. Um, and, and so, yeah, I would just, you know, remember that restorative justice is a big part of, you know, the work that I've led over the years. And so, you know, we all, in, in some sense, can cause harm to others, uh, but how do we as a community kind of create standards and practices for how we treat that harm and how we rehabilitate that harm um, uh, to bring us back to a place where we're all commonly connected? Um, so yeah, I would, those are kind of the two practices I would think about um, in the frame of cancel culture. Thank you. Tracy? I think I already answered. I was the first one to go, but I mean, I think, I think what everyone else said. I think, I think the idea is that we we do need to listen to each other, and even when you don't like someone's opinion, which is really, really hard. I have a hard time doing that. Um, but that's sort of the only way where you can go forward. And also, I mean, especially it is difficult, obviously, when people, some people are, are just having this contrary opinion to have it, right? And maybe they're wielding misinformation and how do you deal with that and navigate that? But I think it is also good to be listening so you can <laughs> to understand where where people stand and how to best address it and how to how to you know how to how to tackle it. So thank yeah. you. So I, I will say just as we were wrapping up, even when we were discussing this topic, there was so much nuance that came up in our pre-call in our conversation earlier today, I suspect we haven't covered all aspects of cancel culture. I will say we're, we're around today. There's so much to be said on this subject, and I suspect there's a lot of very different experiences in this room right now. So I encourage you all to continue this conversation. We're certainly not wrapping it up on this panel. We'll continue it in the work of MPAC. We'll continue it through the work that we all do every day. Thank you so much. Thank you for being generous with your ears and mouths and being quiet. Thank you. Thank you.